form of a congenital heart disease. So um, I was always had a heart problem from birth. I had, uh, it was a great ministry, I had some surgery when I was 14. <coughs> and that was, it was all going okay until a couple of years ago, um, I got in trouble with my heart, I went really fast. I went into the hospital when I had an arrest, a cardiac arrest. Um, a few things transpired. I made a recovery fine, but they realised that my heart wasn't going to last that long. Uh, they didn't know how long, but um, I had a, when I was 14, I had a metal heart valve put in, and it broke. It sort of broke a couple of years ago. So they thought, although I was still well, I was still sort of still go to work and stuff. They said about two years ago that a long-term plan. They, it was really nice. They said uh, we want to turn you into old bones, which is quite a nice expression. Um, they said the best way we can see for that is a heart transplant. Um, but this is my hospital in London, and they don't. London hospitals don't do transplants for adults, so they can't make the decision. They can't say, you know, we're going to put you on this day to send you to the hospital, which is in Newcastle. So they uh, send me up there for an, you have an assessment first, which is a pretty a pretty standard thing. Everyone goes for these assessments on to go on the transplant list, and it's quite hard, apparently, to get on the transplant list. Like it's a very fine line. You've got to be ill enough to be on the list because they keep the list very small because there's so few donors they have to keep this small because there's no point in it otherwise so you've got to be ill enough to be on the list but well enough to be able to have the surgery so it's a very sort of niche sort of amount of people um, so I went up to Newcastle which was in July last year for my assessment uh, they couldn't decide they saw my scans and um, they sort of talked amongst themselves and it's, they, they all come round to you in your, in your hospital room, you know, all the doctors walk in you think, oh, what have they decided? <laughs> you know? um, and in the end, after we went back up in November last year, um, actually not you know, November last year, the year before now, yeah, uh, 2008, they said we were going to put you on the uh, transplant list, the active transplant list. Um, and that was, so that was that. So waited on the list at home for about from November 2008 to through to March 2009 when they actually brought me into the hospital, into the Freeman in Newcastle, to wait as an inpatient because they, they weren't sure about me how well I was going to be. Like, I was, although I was well, I, was, I could, could deteriorate rapidly. Uh, this is the problem, is it? Most people with a certain condition will deteriorate slowly over time so they know when to bring you into hospital, they know when you're more, more urgently needed to be transplanted with me. I was quite well and they knew I'd have just, just sort of crashed so they brought me in a little bit early in a sense to the Freeman to wait there for the transplant and I was waiting for five weeks in hospital and they had the transplant on the 3rd of May 2010. So how has life been since the 3rd of May 2010? It's been, it's been amazing really yeah. <coughs> See, tra heart transplants when I say for normal people, that sounds a bit, but heart transplants for people with uh, heart disease that they've contracted later on in life, they can become very, very ill, you know, obviously critically ill, and they get returned to health, pretty much, which is wonderful. With congenital heart patients, which is much rarer to have a transplant, um, they haven't even been doing them that long, because they're so much more complicated. The, the way the heart is, the way it connects to the body, is so different to normal people's hearts that... There's a lot more, and you've had previous surgeries as well, most can, people with congenital heart disease, so they're much rarer, that's why it's only Newcastle that does them. So they're much harder to do, much rarer. So when, when they happen, when, when, I, when you have one like me, it, it's a different thing altogether to a normal heart transplant because I've never been able to do certain things that I can never do. So like, when I was growing up, I could never play football with my friends. Uh, could never go running, could never walk up more than five flights of stairs. Well, I'm walking on the flat, I was okay, I could work in the city in, in, in the back, in, in, on an office job, um, go on holiday with my friends, you know, I can do stuff like that, but if I had to actually exert myself at all, um, I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't, couldn't even like say play cricket, I couldn't play cricket, because if you had to do more than four or five runs, you know, if you managed to get the ball, the first time I, I went on a bike ride with my mum, for it was about a 15 mile bike ride. Um, and you know, we just both had tears in our eyes. They're really, really emotional because it's just the feeling of, of, of strength, of not, of not becoming weak. You know, of like uh, the first time in my life I've been able to do things like this. You know, I've played squash with my friends. Um, as I say, I've been on bike rides with my mum. I've, uh, I've played badminton with you know with other friends. I've been swimming, you know, lengths after lengths. So much, unbelievable. Uh, are you still being monitored by Newcastle? Yes. Yeah, I am. Yes. Yeah, uh, they, the way they say it is that when you first have a transplant, you're on a very tight leash <laughs> and you have to you have to see them a lot. And um, 
and they sort of slowly let the leash go out and you know, as your time going up to them gets less and less and less, you know, like, so at the moment I'm going up there every six weeks, which is still quite, quite you know, considering it's Newcastle, quite a long distance. It sounds like quite a lot and a lot of people think, oh, that's, that's a lot, because it used to be every two weeks. When I first come back home, I go up there every two weeks and then it goes to three weeks and four weeks and six weeks and it goes to three months and then six years. Because it's so recent, it's only you know, 10, 11 months ago, um, it really, you do have to do have to quite a lot, but as it stretches out like year after year, then it really starts to you know push out to yearly checkups. Sort of and it's great you've got two young children. Yes, it's great to yeah. being an ordinary active dad. Yes, that's what's the matter. I mean, like when my, my transplant, my my old, oldest, my still young Alex, was six months old, so he was still a baby. You can't, you know, you couldn't do too many. There were still things I couldn't do with him. Like if I was, if we was out walking. I couldn't really, if, there's, if we had shopping in the trolley, in the uh, buggy, we couldn't really push him, I couldn't push him up a hill or anything. Um, but now, and now like, I could, you know, I can play with Alex, I can like sort of chuck him around and run upstairs with him, and, you know, and not get tired. And our other little, little girl, little Erica, who's just been born only four weeks ago, um, I don't have to fear anything now. Like, with Alex, before, because obviously I had my, I had my uh, before my transplant, Pam was pregnant with Alex. I was so nervous about all the things you wouldn't be able to do as a father, you know, with a boy, you know, running around, play football with him. Um, even like if you have to carry him for a mile because he's too knackered to walk, or, you know, carry all the bags and the out the stick, you know, the, the parent has to, you know. I was, so now when that little Erica has been born, I, I don't have to fear anything like that, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Do you have to teach people not to treat you like gloves? Well, <coughs> that's funny because a lot of people ask that. Um, not, not really. Um, it, because before my transplant, um, I was still quite similar looking uh, to what to I am now. I, I wasn't really symptomatic with heart failure, and this was part of my condition. Like they said, although I don't look too bad, I would just crash. So, not many people saw me ill, in a sense. So, uh, they treat me very similar, very very similar. Sometimes, I mean, I think they treat me too, you know, because <laughs> they see me, you know, playing squash and going to work and being really, you know, and then they might, I think, you know, sometimes, oh, could you, you know, grant me a bit more sympathy for having, I've just had a heart transplant, you know, sometimes it works, works the other way more than people, you know, grant you too much sort of like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, leeway sort of thing. You decided to put your experiences, your journey, as they say, yeah. on, on, on paper. Yes, yeah, originally, initially it was my wife's idea, I didn't plan it, when we first got up to Newcastle, the very first day in the hospital, because so it's going to be waiting around and you don't know how long you're going to wait on a dialysis list. I mean, <coughs> it could be months, it could be, you know, in hospital, living in hospital, you know, by myself, Pam was at a different house, so, you know, so I was doing a lot of time by myself, so Pam said, oh, you could write a journal. Uh, so I'd done that, I just, I didn't want well, to think about, you know, turning it into a book or anything, but I just started writing the, the journel, literally for a journal, it's just daily writing it and it, and it become, it was meant to be just a time for that, it was meant to be just something to do. But after, a, only after about a week, it, it already become a, a lot more. It become like a whole way for me to channel everything I was feeling, a whole sort of like way to be able to explore what I'm going through and to be able to like, uh, uh, you know, confide your fears and, and your dreams. And, and almost like a main coping mechanism for me become, uh, and I'm writing it every day, like hours every day. And uh, after, so, uh, so I, was, I didn't know how long you'd be writing it before transplant, so it comes to the transplant. During the transplant, my mum and my wife wrote in it instead, whilst I was in theatre, in uh, intensive care. That was the plan. And then um, after I took back over writing, I got better, uh, you know, discharged from hospital, but still have to live up in Newcastle for a while. And yeah, I was carrying on my journal. I had three whole journals at this time, and uh, I decided to finish it when I come back to this home, my home, yeah, my home home back here. And so I finished it with the day I went back home and uh, decided to type it up, put it into a book, and uh, that's what I've done. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody wants to get hold of the book, how do they get hold of that? Uh, it's called A Change of Heart, uh, My Heart Transplant Journal at the Freeman Hospital. And it can be found online, really anywhere, Amazon, WH Smith, um, by Max Crompton. Yeah, that's how you find it. Thank you.